to whip this. Today we have an application of silk following first uh, the main theme of Dr. Richard Gorman's visit at INSEP, which is basically developing a framework for adaptive meshes for use in WaveWatch 3, our in-house wave model, which became pretty much widespread. I'll just make a quick introduction to Dr. Richard Gorman. Uh, Richard is Australian, also New Zealander. He uh, did his bachelor's and PhD in physics at the University of Melbourne. And he has quite a few uh, peer-reviewed uh, publications. He's a very relevant scientist in the field. He's kind of like a complete wave modeler, if such thing exists. He has done work with uh, nonlinear interaction source functions, uh, grid uh, development, basically operational implementation, as well as uh, the adaptive grid that he will be sharing with us today. Uh, so I'll just pass it on to, to Richard, if you'd like to make a, another remark. Uh, of course, Richard is now a uh, scientist at the uh, National Institute of Water and Atmosphere in New Zealand, which is kind of like the equivalent of NSEP for the Kiwis. So, Richard, welcome. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm going to run through those two areas of work I've been um, doing in my time here in the last few months. Um, first is about uh, trying to get uh, wave watch working in an adaptive grid. Uh, and second, I'm talking about um, automated model optimization using SIL. So, um, firstly, you talk about the adaptive work. So, this really started off back around 2010 um, when uh, Stefan Poppene was, was at me, working at NEWA, and he um, was a developer of. Jiras, which is a, a, a framework for doing adaptive mesh refinement. In that, in that case, generally for all sorts of um, Navier Stokes problems and in the air or the water. So, if this really works, I've shown a few times before. It's just uh, showing Jiras applied to. Oh, okay. That's sad. So what this is, is just a simulation of um, the model of, chain, uh, of the airflow past our research vessel. And if this moved, you'd see that as the, the flow developed, the, the mesh uh, refines and coarsens according to where the, um, there's most happening in the, in the atmosphere. So it works on a quad tree grid, in which case um, you start off with a uh, rectangle, and if you need to, you refine it down successively with the higher resolution. Okay, so why might this be useful for waves? Um, you know, wave models can be fairly computationally expensive. Um, you need to often need to apply them in very large domains, uh, so even globally. But if you've got a simulation where uh, say that the, the driving wind fields are very intense, like around a, a hurricane, you'll want to have high resolution there, which you might not be able to afford over the whole domain. And where you need the, re the resolution, <coughs> you can't predict in advance, it evolves with time um, with, with the, the storm system. So, got together with um, Stefan and um, got um, Jeris to um, to solve, uh, to solve the um, spectral wave model, basically. So, um, if you look at the um, underlying equations for, say, wave watch or other spectral wave models, you have a propagation in terms on the left, which handle the infection, which we got Jeris to do, and it would just pick up wave watch subroutines to. Um, solve the local things like have the wind input and dissipation, etc. And we did it, applied it to some test, test cases, for example, just a, a sort of a, a Holland model type cyclone, um, which was a um, spatially varying wind field moving, in, the, in this case, southwards at a certain speed, and got the 
model to simulate that. So if you look at the adaptive mesh uh, at a certain stage in the simulation, on the, on the left of the, is the significant wave height field around where the, the cyclone is. Um, on the right is the, the, the mesh at that time, starting out in, in far from the, uh, the storm, you know, course resolution the way up at 200 kilometres. Um, getting progressively smaller down where there's high gradients in the, the wave height field. Um, and in this case, we set the, the model to, to adapt the mesh according to the, the second derivative of the, the, the significant wave height in space because we realised that the actual truncation error involved in just um, just, a sim just representing a, a surface on a, a, on a grid is proportional to the, that second derivative of, the, of whatever you're trying to simulate. Hence, it gets a whole lot more um, refined where there's, a, there's rapid change in, in, the, in the field. And we looked at, okay, what uh, the, the difference uh, arrangements of the spatial resolution how much computing time does it take to run that, such a simulation? So, for instance, as a benchmark, we ran standard wave watch, which shows in, in green. So, if you have a if your maximum spatial resolution is 26 kilometers, it, it takes a certain time as you ref, refine the whole mesh down, half that and half that again, the computing time goes up in that way. Now, if you um, use the same Jeros code, but still run on that same um, fixed, fixed mesh, there is a bit of overhead, so you, you put up, the, up the, the run time a bit. But if you let the, the mesh adapt, so that, say in this case, the highest resolution is, is the same as the resolution you've got everywhere there, you, but for most of, the, most of the domain you've got much lower resolution, and of course that cuts down the computing time significantly. And that's scaled uh, as, so, as, a, as a approximately uh, inversely as the mesh size the computing time in that case. But we also checked that, yes, the, the, actually the results from the model, the, the maximum difference between the, uh, well, the, max, the, the difference between the, the results was, was essentially they're giving the same results. Um, now that was just a, a bit, you know just a very artificial case where, where for most of the domain you've got virtually no wind happening anyway. So, so this might not these results might not translate to a more realistic case. So just as a test, um, we looked at just just took some typical wave field an arbitrary time significant wave height field, and if you applied the same method, look at okay if we have a, an adaptive model. Um, what mesh would we end up using to give essentially the same error as a standard uniform mesh? So that means we're, we're using that second derivative of a significant wave height field to decide how fine the mesh is. And what we look at just down the bottom is the, the truncation error um, associated with having a, a uniform resolution. And the truncation error, where it's high, is only very very limited. So in fact you'd only need to have really high resolution at these limited areas where there's a rapid um, change in the big gradients or second curvature in the, in the wind field or near islands or something like that <coughs> where which produces corresponding big gradients or curvature in the wave height field. So in fact you could um, do a lot of refine uh, or coarsening of the mesh and get away with not introducing any much extra error. And so this, this is just looking at how that scales. So this is all sort of preliminary work with um, that, both with the, the, the Jeris version of it and just looking at what, or what might be the advantages of it. But looking towards the future from there, um, what, there are some disadvantages in, in sticking with, with Jeris code and couple, coupling up just to some of the source terms taken from WaveWatch. Um, well, firstly, it was 
it was using old, pretty old uh, version of Wagner for those source terms. It wasn't set up to handle realistic uh, I.O. And there are some things which do depend on the, the spatial, uh, on the grid structure, which aren't purely local, such as how, how uh, you know, ice subgrid obstruction, which we couldn't represent at all. And so, in a, as a sort of pragmatic thing, such a model wouldn't really stay anywhere the cutting edge of the, the rest of the wave physics. It's sort of a nice, it's a nice little toy which has this adaptivity, but otherwise it's not going to be cutting edge wave model. So, um, decided, well, I decided to try building adaptive, adaptivity into wave, wave watch. And so that's basically what I started before I got here. I'm trying to spend this time putting a bit more effort into that develop. So I just want to give you a little bit of update on where that's at. And I'll talk about how this actually is going to work in, in, the, in the wave watch. So the, the way, we're going to be now be working on a, a quad tree structure for the grid. So um, just explain that. You start with a um, so this big blue box as one as one cell, grid cell, and in some places you refine it down, um, down to these uh, magenta ones, there's four cells there. Some places you refine further into these red ones and another level of refinement, and finally down to some of these black cells. So there's different levels of refinement you could have depending on um, what the solution is locally. Um, so in this version, each, each of these leaf cells, which are at the sort of font, the bottom of this tree, will, will correspond to this, the C point index in WaveWatch. Um, so one of one of the important things we need to cater for um, is is the inputs, because fundamentally, the where <coughs> where you might need to refine or or of course, and, um, the wave model is going to be highly dependent on the various inputs. Firstly, on the bathymetry, which just just as in, in the static case, you you might, you will need, might want to have the high resolution nearer the shore, and you can get away with lower resolution offshore, which you, can, you currently do with the that's our triangular unstructured mesh. Um, but that, of course, is static for a time. But we, okay, so we still need to handle those inputs. Both, both for bathymetry and also for potentially for other mo models, because this is probably only going to come into its own when you actually got a weather model driving, which is also adaptive, also handles different uh, levels of um, spatial resolution. Okay, so one of the things to um, try to do is get um, is handle all the inputs on similar quad tree structures. Um, so, for instance, you might might have even looking at it, doing it statically, just without the um, adapting in time, you might you might be settled having uh, coarse resolution in some areas and fine resolution in others. So you might have your bathymetry defined on a coarse grid in some places and refined further, so that have your bathymetry defined on a quad tree. Now. Um, with the static inputs, you got to um, uh, you want um, that one to be as the, the wave model evolves. You want that to, to, to handle that. So if if at some time a particular cell, a particular region has got, it's got coarse, it's coarse resolution, you, you want to have already have the bathymetry and any subgrid obstructions handled at that level. So um, try to set that set that up to pre-compute. At all levels, the, the bathymetry and, and the subgrid obstruction terms. Um, also, you need to set up, uh, handle other inputs like wind, currents, etc., and on, on the quad tree. And those those could be diff different. You might have inputs from a current model, model uh, inputs from a weather model with different um, resolution structures. So we set up to handle those on different. Log uh, realizations of the, of the general plot tree structure. Um, okay, so the, so I guess as, as an example of that, um, it's just a, a very 
very coarse uh, mesh around New Zealand, which was the one before. Remember that. Um, so just test simulation, just with the, the just with the first order propagation scheme on the quad tree. So yes, we actually do have some sort of wave model here. Um, so in this case, we are adapting according to the significant wave height field. So um, compared to the previous grid, which defined um, sort of the, the highest resolution you can have, we've actually. Uh, I should go back to uh, never mind. Don't mind me. Um, now this area here where there's lower wave heights, we've, we've, we don't have the highest resolution here where we do, we've got higher resolution at a in time. Okay, another thing <coughs> we need to work on is um, the propagation scheme. We need to get a more realistic uh, propagation scheme. So we um, put in the, the UNO2 scheme, just you know, second order rather than just the, the first order one I started with. So you need to just test how that, that um, copes. Just, so just been doing some test cases. So here's an example where we've, we've got a different, ref this is just shows the refinement level. So we start off with a coarse grid out here. This is the, the, in coarse grid units, so there's only 10, or, uh, yeah, nine, nine cells, four cells here. Um, First level of refinement there, higher resolution there. Just make sure everything propagates through okay. Sensibly. So you see this is really quite blocky resolution, but it is coping all right. And another example with um, high resolution in the middle and making sure I can propagate through these changes of resolution. Coping all right. So really just to get a, a summary of where the, the adaptive model is at, a um, big part of it is to just to bring the work I've done previously up to date with the, 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 the current uh, master EMC, well, the trunk. Um, you've developed a new branch off that trunk, so I've brought all the code into that. Um, Got some models, modules to handle all the, these quadri operations to do the refinement, etc., and um, to apply that in, in WaveWatch. As I said, handling the symmetry and obstructions at multiple levels, so we're sort of all we're pre-computed for whatever level of refinement you you need. Um, handling inputs, whether winds, currents, etc. Which is coming in from NetCDF. So if you've got a, a NetCDF file of, of um, say, winds on, on some, or a set of NetCDF files as you might classically have with a, you know, a global wind, a, a higher resolution on a set of regular grids, you can handle that and, and put, import those onto the quad tree structure. Um, develop uh, the restart files to so save the, the present state of the quad tree mesh and got grid of outputs working now so that the, well, uh, processing those to an NCDF format at the end. Um, a few things still haven't done. Um, yeah, the M <coughs> message passing interface, that, uh, it is coded but still not sure that that's totally working so the, the sad story is I, I can't have a nice um, Large scale wave model to present it with today, it's still still not in progress. But we've got we've got the uh, a, a higher order propagation scheme, the UNO2, UNO2. It might be nice to get a version of the UQ so we can at least compare it, but, but probably in practice we, we, we might end up running it on the UNO2. Um, yes, yeah, so I've handled subgrid obstructions at multiple levels, as I've said. Uh, the spectral propagation and all the local source terms are all working. You still need to address some more um, some fancy terms like that, um, like reflections, bottom scattering, and the newer ice physics need to need, still need to be addressed. So yeah, I guess the short story is that yeah, it's a bit still a work in progress, but it's uh, getting closer. So that's that part of the, the talk. Oh, maybe any questions about the, the adaptive work at this stage?
Yeah, that's the picture. Um, I guess in the spectral space it's stationary, right? Yeah, yeah. At this, that's sort of one thing for the for the future. It'd be really nice to have the, the spectral mesh at that, that thing too. But um, that is probably going to be a bit more complicated to, to hang on this. To deal with the quantity. I know. There's a, <laughs> you have to deal with the yeah, so interactions. So. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I have a question yeah. about. Uh, so we have an SMC type grid, which is an oil adapted yeah. grid type. It's not dynamically like yours. Mm. But how do you compare one approach with the other? And are there kind of, of course, the dynamically adapting is, is really a nice feature, but are there other features that are you adding value to that or the different approaches? Um, yeah, I, I guess, you, well, you could. Uh, in a, in a static case, yeah, the, the quadri is very similar to the, to the SMC, SMC grid. Um, so you, you could sort of use it instead of doing it. In some sense, although near, near the pole, we still haven't really addressed that, that issue in the high latitudes the same way as the SMC grid. I, I can imagine if we could, could do that, but that would be quite And then again, SMC has a few. Uh, uh, Approaches in terms of filtering, refraction, and depth. Do you have those kinds of limitations in your approach as well? Um, I haven't built those in. You could still you could choose to use those on, on top of the grid. You mean in terms of the white panel with refraction? Yes. That's I mean, that, that's you could, you could you, for SMC. Yeah. It's not a requirement for you. No. Okay. But that's built in a regular grid too, right? The filter. Which is yeah, I think it's a different. Yeah, I won't, so I won't guarantee. Uh, okay. So you can basically use the actual bathymetry as it comes in. You don't have to make any assumptions or uh, limitations in terms of depths when you go to higher resolution or coarser resolution. Well, I mean, you'd, you'd, you'd probably set up your choice of adapting or adapting the grid to, sure. to represent the higher resolution. Yeah. And Oh, I did mention, of course, that for the propagation, is the time stepping is has changed the time stepping as well. So, so you're still, your dynamic grid adjustment is just based on the overall wave height. Um, well, you can you can choose you can choose various uh, methods, but you, yeah, at this stage, that's an option to base it on the. The way if I feel, or the second derivative of it, or whatever, or of the, or of the wing, it would be nice to, to break it down by, from the perspective of this. The I mean, the, in, in the most extreme, in the most extreme version, mm -hmm. uh, or, or one extreme version would be to have a different spatial bit for different spectral components. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. But that that becomes a nightmare with doing the physics and all the other stuff. Yeah. But the intermediate step that you could do is to define your local grid refinement the same for every spectral component, but look at different parts of the spectrum in terms of way we refine it. Yeah. So for instance, you could get uh, around to a model, you could get uh, in cases of, uh, of a swell field going through, having a sharp sweat shadow <coughs> between behind the swell field, mm. create that area where you want to do the sharp shadow uh, with higher resolution, for all the spectral components, but still based on that specific swell field. Mm. So, so you could probably go a lot further with how you do adaptive without changing what you're doing inside of the code, yeah. just by determining how you do the local refinement. Yeah, yeah, that, um, that's what I'd like to, to, to do, to, to, to look at the spatial variation of each component and force whatever composite of that. Yeah, because the other, the other extreme would be to do the to do the same thing in spectral space. Yeah. But that becomes a nightmare with noise interactions, and that becomes a, and then the bookkeeping becomes a real nightmare between all the different uh, dimensions. Yeah. yeah. I bet the low frequencies will dominate that stuff. Yeah, because, because they, they feel that that the, the seabed. The well, well, the 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 seabed is a local problem, yeah. but if you have an individual swell field going through an island chain. You have very specific areas where you have shadows, yeah. and that would be a dynamic piece. You would literally see the, you you would you would literally see the swell field going like this, but the the 
the, the, the shadow going like this, you would see this little blob of, of high yeah. resolution going forward just to make sure that that, that that shadow stays really sharp in that one spectral field, wave field. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the shadow is one thing. The other thing is refraction on the, on the upwind part because we have we had endless problems with that with uh, unstructured meshes that are not resolved well enough, like around these islands like Puerto Rico and Hawaii, and then these very long waves they try to refract in, but they, if this, if you don't refine the island well enough, it just it, you you kill it on the refraction, like refract 90 degrees, it becomes unstable. Mm -hmm. So so that's why I'm thinking probably if you do this, then this seabed will the long frequency long waves will. Have the the seabed will really dominate that criteria. Yeah, but you could even this gets a little bit into detail. But you could be you could get even way more uh, uh, advanced with that because yeah, the high bathymetry, high high, high uh, refraction bathymetry is important, but not if there's no waves going there. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can actually pre-compute that, you know, according to your wave climate, you no, can determine if you're going to have an effect or not depending yeah. on the, the great bathymetry gradients. And you know that those areas are going to need refinement under certain circumstances. Yeah, but the, the point the point is that you can do the strategy of trying to do your refinement of the grid everywhere, or you can put you can keep it like you're doing right now with doing the refinement of the spatial grid, and spending much more effort on figuring out where to do the refinement. And, and that is probably much easier than making this a five-dimensional problem mm. instead of a two-dimensional problem. I'd like, uh, like to ask if somebody on the phone has uh, questions about the uh, adaptive grid uh, for Richard. Yeah, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No phone questions? Yeah. Hi, uh, Enrique Brown, BBC. Okay. So, uh, coming from operations, the <laughs> question is, <laughs> when can I see something? <laughs> Yeah, I sort of, if you'd asked me three months ago, I would have said by now, but, <laughs> so, yeah, unfortunately, as a sort of, the progress might even slow down a bit. Yeah, it's a little while, so. Yeah, then yeah, there's, there's the development component of the yeah. base code itself, and then there is the uh, putting it into operations part, which is probably a little bit more complicated. Yeah. Well, it, and, it has a lot and of And then my other question, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, go on, sorry. Uh, the other question is, is this something that um, would be adaptable enough that we could apply it to other modeling systems, specifically on, on wind and waves? So, mm -hmm. you know, just seeing that, that one graphic you had of, of everywhere that you would probably, inc you know, increase the, uh, increase the number of points, and it's everywhere that I care about all those storm systems. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, uh, would be, you know, are you going to are you going to even have a, a global wind grid that would go fine enough that you'd be able to do that, or do we need would we have to run the GFS that way and yeah. the wave watch? Um, yeah, well, well, Jeros itself, where I started off, is is used for adaptive mesh refinement. It's not, uh, but not presently on such a, a large large scale. So. Um, I'm not going to about, about to develop a new wind uh, atmospheric model with this with this, this tool. So I mean, I'm not, I'm not really in a position to to make any promises there. But so since yeah. you're not making any promises, yeah. um, the underlying Garish approach. How does that scale on exascale computing? Yeah. How, or, or how does that? How far have you been able to go with that in terms of the amount of processes that you would use? Um, <coughs> yeah, at the moment I believe it's not very, not so good, but we have been doing some work on, on running a, well, uh, Basilisk, which was sort of evolved from Jeris on, on GPGPUs, mm -hmm. so that, that might, if that, that would. So, so Fran, going back to your question, um, this is something that could and should have showed up uh, as we did our DICOR cook-off for uh, uh, NGGPS. And uh, so one of the issues with, with this kind of code is that uh, I, I, I may not just be up to speed on all the, all the publications yet, but it's not clear to me whether this is as efficient as some other things when you go to 100,000 or a million processes. And so that's an issue to think about. And on a side note, uh, 
uh, we had something like an Omega model that was the uh, hurricane weather model that did dynamic grid. It had the same issue with, with being efficient enough because of all the overhead for continuously readjusting the grid and the scaling of that. And in the NGGPS GICOR comparison, the Navy Neptune core actually uses something like theirs for dynamically adjusting the vertical resolution. And so it is slowly making its way into weather, but weather is so specialized that, that you, you would be so far uh, uh, no negativity in, 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 in inferred, but you're so far behind the, cue, the curve in terms of, uh, of the maturity of, uh, of, of the details of a lot of the weather model stuff that that would be something that you need much more than Richard just working on. But, but the, the idea is that if you look at the different advanced numerical techniques in weather models, especially if you look at the DICOR comparison, uh, uh, FE3 and MPAS are interesting because they use different grids, but they are still relatively conventional in the sense that they use fairly conventional finite element, finite volume techniques. What the Navy was doing with uh, their uh, Neptune model, that is really trying to go to a next generation because the Neptune model, the horizontal grid, is very similar to AdSurg, so you use a finite uh, element technique where you can get a lot more accuracy just by controlling locally the, the, uh, the truncation error in the, in the scheme. So, that is, so Neptune is way ahead numerically compared to a lot of other grids. Neptune is also way ahead in the vertical because the vertical refinement technique is the one-dimensional version of Garris, essentially. Hendrik. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not a quad, it's a dual tree. But we do need to uh, move on to the next presentation unless we have a very short uh, question from somebody on the phone. A very short question, I'm just expecting <laughs> 45.